Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're continuing to look at David H. Steele's critique of Lewis F. Weir and James White uh, regarding uh, their views on Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit to teach us. You know, Lord, uh, that we know little. And we live in a world that's very confusing, world of sin. And um, we know, Lord, that that sin lies deep within us. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you can continue through your word and through your spirit uh, to reveal to us our need of you, that we can confess our sins and forsake them and follow in the path that Jesus has laid out before us, that he has gone before and made this way of escape. We invite your spirit to open our, our understanding of ourselves as we look at how um, we deal with those that we disagree with and how we come to understand truth. Be with each person searching, guide and direct them, and be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. And so we were just moving into, uh, in this paper, to the critique of James White. So uh, David H. Thiel isn't just addressing Louis F. Weir, uh, his views, uh, but he's trying to address what uh, James White has said about these verses. Now, he does a little bit, you know, as we've pointed out, a little bit of mind reading and impugning motives upon James White and, and Louis F. Weir. And um, we know we've talked a bit about, you know, how do we deal with people that differ with us? How do we present an argument? Um, you know, we need to avoid uh, highly charged uh, rhetoric, emotional language, argumentative language. We need to be able to present the evidence for people to look at and evaluate dispassionately. Uh, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work and not try to do that work for the Holy Spirit. Um, so we're just going to read over uh, this, this paragraph here, and then we're going to look at, uh, well, I'm actually going to go back a little bit here, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to just go back. Now, this is James White. So as, as uh, Thiel says, James White wants Rome, the beast cast into the fire, to be the king of the north. Because he concluded that being cast into the fire is the fulfillment of he shall come to his end and none shall help him. But this conclusion is also flawed in its logic. So this was a really interesting concept that... Uh, uh, we had from Thiel the idea that there is there's more than one power. There's the beast and the king of the north at the end and that they're different. Um, so something I'd never heard before. And so then when we dealt with this, now Stephen was here and, and I was trying to understand uh, what Thiel was saying. So we're just going to read uh, this here. From Revelation 19 and 20, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go to deceive the nations, which are at the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So when, when I was reading his explanation here, 
Um, and Stephen sort of corrected me because I don't think I understood it properly. Daniel depicts a power that meets its solitary end. None shall help him, but in Revelation, the beast does not meet its end in a solitary, completely helpless manner. Both These both, beast and false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire. Not only that, but later the devil is cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are, because the devil deceived and helped them without lasting success. Furthermore, the end of the beast and the false prophet occur after the time of trouble mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 1. But the language of Daniel indicates that the king of the north comes to his solitary end before Michael stands up. So there's, I, I was thinking that he was saying that there is two different, um, that since there's two different powers, the beast and the false prophet, that, that maybe he was suggesting, Theo was suggesting that, you know, false prophet was one of those that come to their end. But the way Stephen explained it makes more sense. And what Theo is trying to say is that it talks about one power coming to its end with none to help him, which he says is the king of the north. And then after the close of probation that we're going to see, like after the time of trouble as well, that um, we're going to have the beast and the false prophet come to their end. So they're not the same powers that come to their end. Right. So he says it's a solitary end. It's all on their own. Now, we looked at that and we could say, well, just because it occurs before 12 verse one doesn't mean that when it says yet he shall come to his end, especially with the when we looked at the verse, Daniel 11, verse 45, he shall plant the, the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. It doesn't mean that he comes to his end prior to 12 verse 1, right? One is we know that Revelation and Daniel and Hebrew prophecies often often written in a repeat and enlarged sense. So we don't just look at things happening continuously. We saw that all through Daniel 11, lots of repeat and enlarge and explanations. So when we have the close of probation then in 12 verse 1, at that time shall Michael stand up. We don't, we don't say that the power had to have come to its end before Michael stands up. It's just talking about this power, what it's going to do. Yet it's going to come to its end. And then it goes back. At that time, shall Michael stand up? There's going to be a close of probation, right? And there's lots of repeat in the large within chapter 12. So, so there's that point. And then, uh, so when we go through his explanation here, what he says, we'll read this a little bit more. Daniel depicts a power that meets its solitary end, right? But in Revelation, the beast does not meet its end in a solitary, completely helpless manner. And then so so we can we can say that they don't have to mention both of them in Daniel 11. Right. So deep more detail is given because the beast and the false prophet in Revelation 13 is an expansion of understanding the Sunday law where the details are not given in Daniel chapter 11. And, and he even acknowledges this idea that more details can be given. Now, he tries to argue that uh, since the, the details of, of France are given in Revelation, they must also have their seed or be given in Daniel. And we said that that doesn't follow. Not every, because he's already argued that there's going to be an expansion or a repeat and enlarge and more details provided. So you don't have to have, uh, not, not France so much, but Turkey as this major power, uh, you know, coming against France or as a whirlwind that doesn't, that's not a major prophecy. Okay. And then, of course, the idea that, um, that these things are consecutive. Furthermore, the end of the beast and false prophet occurs after the time of trouble mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 1. So we know that's the case, but it doesn't mean that when it talks about him coming to his end in 11, verse 45, at the end of that verse, that that means it precedes uh, Michael standing up or the time of the end or the, or the time of trouble. In a sense, you could see it's just kind of the, the, the seed is there and, and it's going to be expanded on in Revelation. So then he tries to say that um, that there is some kind of and, and he's implying here either either Weir was just ignorant of these historical nuances, 
in his defense of James White, or he did not care to make them prominent in his writings because they expose weaknesses. But one of the things we see with Theo is that, in my view anyway, he doesn't lay everything out. He doesn't show his own weaknesses in his arguments. And he doesn't show the strength of Thiel's argument. That is, he tries to make Thiel's argument look weak. He uses all kinds of language. He tries to, uh, he uses some straw man arguments. He uses some misrepresentation to suggest that, that Weir is teaching that, uh, the plagues begin before the close of probation, for instance, which it's quite clear that Weir never says that. And, and then he says, rather, he begins his objections by stating that the Ottoman Empire in the past could not have been the king of the north, the Turkish Republic in the present, nor could it could not be the king of the north. The facts of Turkish history, history will not fit the prophetic mold. Um, just comparing the statement with the facts just previously presented demonstrates the inadequacy of Weir's conclusion, which we don't agree with. But rather than supplying the reader with historical facts that would support his conclusion, he relies upon other arguments to make it appear that Turkish history does not fit. We shall attempt to understand the weaknesses of his arguments in their order. Now, he says he begins his objections with a conclusion, right? And so even how Thiel is, is expressing this, is he's not he's not being fair and he's going to understand the weaknesses of his arguments now one of the things that i often do because if i am trying to show someone where they may be in error and and i'm writing a paper you you can see this in in lots of my papers i'm going to show the strengths of the arguments of the other person not their weaknesses. That is, I'm not going to try to tear down what the person is saying in by by weakening their position. Anybody can attack weak arguments, especially when you misrepresent them. So just even in this idea, attempt to understand the weaknesses of his arguments in their order, I don't think is the best way to present the truth. I was going to say it's quite easy to pick at flaws. Yes, Ellen White talks about it, picking at flaws. Because we all have flaws in our arguments. Now, especially when we present an argument. So one of the things um, that I see often happen. So let's say you're in a discussion with somebody. You're, you know, you see like a YouTube video and somebody's having a discussion. Now, you often have to take shortcuts. You sometimes have to say things in a way that you can't fully support everything that you say, right? It's not possible. You only have a certain amount of time, whether you're, you're speaking or whether you're writing a paper. Unless and, it's a PhD. Well, even, but even if it's a PhD, there has to be things that are assumed, right? Okay. I've never written one, so I just yeah, well, find it interesting I mean, that it there takes so long. Base, there's a base of knowledge that is assumed, especially mm-hmm. in a particular topic in a particular discipline, you're not going to have to prove everything that you believe. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, yeah, okay. We don't yeah. have to prove and, that we're alive. Well, nowadays it's almost in question. We're in a, yeah. But yeah, there's just an assumed body of knowledge, whatever discipline you're in, that you, you're going to operate on. And so you talk within that context. Now, sometimes people will pick at someone because they didn't answer something that they think needs to be answered. Um, or they're going to, they're going to point out a logical fallacy, right? The appeal to authority or something like that. And, and yet there's often lots of reasons why that person has made that statement that they're not sharing. And, and I find this in the area of biblical chronology. Like people will ask me lots of questions, which I like. They'll say, well, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? Because I'm not going to explain everything because I just don't have the time. And the fact that they can notice that there are things that aren't explained and they can ask about them is is really helpful. And, it, and it's good for them that they can notice these things. Uh, so Stephen doesn't pay, do paying attention. Yeah, they're paying attention. They're, and they I, care. They care about it. Yeah. Now, there are people who just come and they attack 
because I make some statement they don't agree with. And even though I have actually supported it in my paper, <laughs> you know, they're not going to read the explanations, right? And, and so yeah. they're just looking for flaws to, to dismiss the entire paper, right? Or, the, or what they see as my motives for writing the paper or what position they think I'm taking. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's almost impossible to, to answer all objections that are going to be presented or being brought against some idea, right? So that's just something that, that I think that we always need to be aware of when we're examining what other people are saying. Even when we're looking at what Theo is saying, we're trying to understand him. Yeah, you know, know, the, we're, the, we're not trying to the, find, you know, fault with him. One of the one of the things I do, like, you know, we get these you know, on Facebook, social media, these hackers that copy other people's accounts, and and they pop up, and I just ask, well, where did we meet? Or something that would that other person, only that other person would know. So, in the yeah. same same way. I, um, if I want if someone is asking me a question about me, I send them. Well, lately, you know, I'll send them one of the presentations talks I was able to do, and then I, I say, well, the person here, and let me know when you have a chance to go through it, and and then we can talk and save a lot of time and get get to know me a little mm -hmm. better. I'd like to know you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a yeah. test. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's look at these arguments that he brings up. Um, those who still believe that this power is the king of the north, evidently appalled by all that is implied by the belief that Turkey will yet move its seat of government to Jerusalem, say little or nothing concerning this feature of their interpretation of Daniel 11, verse 45, that this is the climax of the prophecy. Okay. So this is what uh, Weir has said. Um, we should be surprised by this objection because it expresses a lack of faith. James White was overwhelmed by his burdens taken up when he had survived a series of strokes. His faith staggered because unsanctified, unsealed men objected to the financial needs of the church. That is why he warned, but in exposition of unfulfilled prophecy where the history is not written, the student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness, lest he find himself strained in the field of fancy. Now, we, we've addressed this before because he's brought this up before. Now, before he was sort of suggesting, you know, reasons why Jeff, why James White might have, have written this. But we can see that, that this is complete mind reading, right? And it's also muddy in the water. So he's going to say, James White only said this because he had, had some strokes and he was, his faith staggered because of unsanctified, unsealed men objecting to the financial needs of the church. So that's why he warned, but in exposition of unfulfilled prophecy. Does, does that even make sense to anyone? Well, it's actually the letters, I think, of Wally White that suggest this originally. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not so much feel here mind reading. He's just going by what Willie White or whoever well, I think it was Willie. Yeah, was, so he's re yeah, you're you're correct there. So Willie Wright wrote some things way later about this history, which which I don't trust. And and why don't I trust Willie White's evaluation of that situation? Well, he already had shown that he wasn't discerning the, the daily. He he was going by what Prescott and A. G. Daniels were promoting. Yeah. In that respect, so he wasn't so he would have differed with the pioneers and Elm White. Yeah. My understanding of that. So therefore I can we trust him in this year as well, you know? And there's also, James White had been writing about the King of the North being the papacy Long way like in the, I think it was the 1850s or something, so when he yeah. wouldn't have been had that stress with the church and so forth. So right. just to sort of say it, that it was connected to that there, to me, is not a, a good argument. This was something that James White had 
promoted and, and sort of believed for for decades prior to that period where he was stressed. Yeah, and and you still have to, to. So with Willie White, he's he seems to be involved in the politics of the church, right? Some of his views seem to appear to be influenced by what's happening around him. That is, he's not really an objective source. And and this is stuff that he's writing about it long after it happened, right? In a different environment. So it's it's sort of a, a retrospective that's been funneled through all of the, the stuff that had been happening in the church. That's that's my understanding of reading Willie White's uh, you know testimonies. Now you're going to have Arthur White also repeating this, but again, it's what I would call hearsay. Right? We don't find any uh, direct evidence from James White or. And, and it doesn't even really make much sense, right? I mean, could we find a connection between men objecting to the financial needs of the church and and James White then giving this warning? Like, is there a logical connection between the two? You know, people might be able to find some kind of connection that, um, you know, or theorize some kind of connection, but I can't really see it. Uh, and then he says here, yet Weir would tempt Smith and others to be more positive in their predictions as he then abandons the church's position and tempted others to also forsake it by this type of objection. So the idea here is that he's saying, well, you have this theory. This is what Weir is saying. Where is this going? Right. Thiel is, is interpreting this that we are is tempting Smith and others to be more positive in their predictions. And then all this, this language here, that he abandons the church's position. Now, is that the church's position? Is the church's position that, that the king of the north is Turkey? No. No, right? Now, it's some people's position, but it's definitely not the church's position. Does the church have a position on the king of the north being Turkey or the papacy or anything like that. We, we would have to say it doesn't have a position. So, right. So this, you know, this is where I have this problem is, is how he's addressing this. And then he's using this tempt, right? Tempting others also to forsake this by this type of objection, which, which I don't think if you read weird that you will find that he's trying to tempt anybody about anything. He's, He's actually presenting more positive arguments rather than, you know, this this cherry pick sort of statement. And we're going to look at Weir, what Weir has to say about it. However, if we can, if we were to consider the belief of a transfer of capital to be impossible, the distance between Rome and Constantinople is about 120 miles less than the distance between Constantinople and Jerusalem. The journey made by Constantine the Great from Rome to Constantinople, Istanbul, is about 1,068 miles to move the government that great a distance in 330 AD would have been a tremendous undertaking. Daniel recorded the interpretation of such an event in Daniel 11:24. And though there is no time prophecy on which to base another move of capital, as suggested by Smith, it is not so outlandish, especially when Turkey has been made, making demands that Jerusalem be returned to them. The ease by which countries can mobilize today is significant compared to the slowness of ancient travel. Any response by those who oppose Turkey's desire to reacquire Jerusalem will also be swift and monumental. Any doubts that Turkey could never fulfill the prophecy would be statements of unbelief in God, who removeth kings and setteth up kings. Now, we might find, you know, this pretty a pretty remarkable sort of argument. So the argument is Smith had made this claim that the capital of Turkey is going to be moved to Jerusalem. Now, we, we, we understand that, that the land of Israel has no part in biblical prophecy. That's how that Israel has no part in biblical prophecy. So, so we have this really divergent view. Now, the way that I would have framed the argument if I was Theo is I would have clearly at the beginning uh, explained my belief about the idea that we need to interpret these kingdoms literally 
right? That we need to, you know, but but that sometimes we're not going to is 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 kind of a problem. So if we're, if Babylon is not going to be Iraq, but it's going to be the papacy, you know, um, or the kingdoms of this world, uh, it's going to be universal rather than local. Uh, how does he support that idea? And and Field doesn't really have a reason to support that idea, right? He's saying that Daniel needs to be taken literally because that's what Smith says. But can we do this with Revelation? Well, he appears to be doing it with some things in the book of Revelation, this mixing of literal and spiritual. Now, so so we could just say, well, it's absurd. The idea that Turkey is going to make Jerusalem its capital, right? This is what Thiel believes, okay? Um, and I've run into other people who believe the same thing. So it's not really about the distance that that we have to move the capital, right? So what kind of argument is that when we talk about the issue of the distance? What is he doing by presenting this, this type of argument? Is that an objection that Thiel is making that it's 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 too far? Uh, you mean he's saying the geographical distance? Yeah, I would say he's making that objection. Yes, you're saying that that we're is we're making the objection that it's too far. No, no. So Thiel, so, is. yeah, Thiel is is saying that it's not too far. I might have said Thiel instead of we're. So Weir is not making, this is not an objection that Weir has given. Weir has not said, the reason why I don't believe that the capital is going to move from Turkey to Jerusalem is because it's too far. So presenting this argument makes no sense because distance is not really the issue with Lewis F. Weir, why he says it's impossible, right? Or is so, it yeah, so the, yeah, the other thing know, is, it's not, is, it's not why the geography. Why would distance be an issue in any argument that's prophetic? Right. 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 Yeah. It's, it's not the argument, right? The argument is that Turkey can't be the king of the north, not because of any distance between uh, uh, Constantinople and Jerusalem, but because the symbols don't fit. We need to understand the symbolic language in the Bible. So when when you present this type of argument, you're 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 deflecting from the actual argument, right? It's not an argument that's being made by Lewis F. Weir. Okay, so and so we need to we need to not put arguments in people's mouths or positions in people's mouths or words in people's mouths when we're when we're discussing with them. Right. Or when we're trying to talk to others about what someone says. You're not going to misrepresent the arguments that a person is making so that you can take down their arguments. Okay, so in reality, Weir is only echoing the objection of James White in this matter. We close this article with inquiries, viewing the past and present. Is there not more probability that the seat of the beast will be moved to our country? then that the seat of the Turkish government will be moved to Palestine. Now, so that's going to be from James White, Unfulfilled Prophecy. Now, what, what is James White asking by this um, rhetorical question? What is, what is he trying to illustrate? We don't have the context here, but we, we know that he doesn't agree with the idea that um, the seat of the beast is going to be... Um, the, it, the, the seat of the beast is going to be moved to our country. Isn't that more probable than the seat of the Turkish government will be moved to Palestine? So, so what is the argument of James White? There's there's a lot underneath this this statement. What, what is what is James White seeing that Smith doesn't see, and and Thiel doesn't see? What is the role of the United States in prophecy? It makes an image to the beast, right? What is the role of Palestine in prophecy at the end of time? Nothing. It doesn't have a part to play, does it? Other than 
just the countries of the world, just the nations that give their yeah. allegiance to the beast. Yeah, but but it's not. We, we don't look to uh, to the Jews or Jerusalem or anything as fulfilling prophecy in connection with the Sunday law. They're not part of of prophecy in that sense, right? We're not looking for wars in Palestine. Now, I think Theol is, right? Based on what he has said, he thinks that, you know, and, and I would think people who are looking at, at Israel, like the evangelicals, the Protestants, like they're looking at what's happening in Israel today, and they're trying to find fulfillments of prophecy in these events. They did it back during the Iraq war, and, and they continue to do this, right? And, and then we have to ask ourselves, is that valid? As Seventh-day Adventists, do we look to Jerusalem? Does Jerusalem have a part to play in Bible prophecy today? Now, we, we've taken the position it doesn't. But if we are wrong about that, we would have to be able to show that we're wrong about that. Now, we often go to Ellen White's statements uh, from early writings, page 74 and 75, where she's going to talk about uh, Sister Minor, right? The ones who believe that we should go back to old Jerusalem. And, and Ellen White says, old Jerusalem will never be built up. Now, some people have used that statement of Ellen White's uh, to show that she's a false prophet. Like, has old Jerusalem been built up? You, you understand the... Uh, statement. Let's see if I can find it here, because I might be paraphrasing it. Spiritually, it is. Well, we're not talking about spiritually. We're talking about. Yeah. Well, even even in Ellen White's day, there was something like so many thousand. There was a city there with at least maybe ten thousand people. So, in a sense, it was already physically built up that time that has grown since no but it's um yeah. Yeah. depends okay. how what, what she's meaning and being built up. Yeah. Yeah, so she's talking about like you know the temple in Jerusalem is not going to be built, all those things, the state that Jerusalem is going to be established again, right? In 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 sort of the biblical sense. Um, so this is uh, early writings. You know, it's going to start on page 74, right? That's where you're going to, you know, you're going to have that. This is actually October 23rd, right? That was a typo of James White that continued to propagate in the different editions of this vision. But it was October 23rd that the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people. It's where I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom, etc. And then this part. Then I was pointed to some who are in great error, believing it is their duty to go to old Jerusalem and think they have a work there. Have they have a work to do there before the Lord comes? Such a view is calculated to take the mind and interest from the present work of the Lord under the message of the third angel. For those who think they are yet to go to Jerusalem will have their minds there. And their means will be held, withheld from the cause of present truth to get themselves and others there. And I saw that such a mission would accomplish no real good, that it would take a long while to make a very, make a very few of the Jews believe even in the first advent of Christ, much more to believe in his second advent. I saw that Satan was great, has greatly deceived some in this thing and that the souls all around them in this land could be helped by them and led to keep the commandments of God but they were leaving them to perish. I also saw that old Jerusalem would never be built up and that Satan was doing his utmost to lead the minds of his children of the Lord into these things now in the gathering time to keep them from throwing their whole interest into the present work of the Lord and to cause them to neglect the necessary preparation for the day of the Lord. So if old Jerusalem is, would never be built up, how would this relate to what we're discussing here? What is what is the issue? So the issue has to do with how, the Turkey part that Israel has to put in prophecy. What's that, Kelly? Turkey and Jerusalem. Which okay, so we're that, well, I think the main point is that Ellen White is just saying, you know, we don't look to what's happening in Jerusalem 
as part of end time prophecy. The United States is where that is the promised land, right? That is the glorious land. You know, once we have literal Israel is no longer God's denominated people with the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD. And, and we don't have God's denominated people again until the Seventh-day Adventist church. Right. So they represent Judah. The United States represents the glorious land. In this literal interpretation of Daniel 11, which then forces us into a literal interpretation of the Battle of Armageddon and things like that, we're now taking our focus in the directions that the evangelicals and the Protestants are, right? Which is why we argue that Smith was using Protestant methods of interpretation. Okay. Somebody had a comment? No, I was just quickly agreeing with you. Okay. Um, I just like to say about um, the time Smith was writing this. Yeah. That, that, uh, Jerusalem obviously was part of in the vicinity of the Ottoman rule. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't have been aware of what took place, the Second First World War, how the Jews then came back. Yeah. And now that it, now that is a significant nuclear power in the Middle East with a significant number of uh, Jews there. And to think that Adventists and I are still looking for Turkey to, in some way, defeat the Jews with their nuclear capability and uh, to set up the capital in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. To me, just I think if Uriah Smith had seen how history played out, I don't, I don't think I think he would drop that idea that Turkey would be the capital, right? Of Jerusalem, yeah. Yeah. And now the thing is, there are people who are still accepting Smith's interpretation and basically it's a lack of faith. And it's a new hermeneutic that has rejected Smith's interpretation. We need to, in their view, accept that this prophecy is going to be fulfilled, even though it seems highly unlikely. Right. That's that's the position Thiel is taking. Right? So, I mean, this is an extreme position, but. You know. It, it's the position that he has and how he's supporting it and how we support our beliefs is really what we're examining here. So it's not so much, you know, people can believe things that that are correct for wrong reasons and people can believe things that are wrong for wrong reasons. Right. So our reasoning and how we support what we believe is more important sometimes than what we actually believe. I mean, it depends what it is we believe, but we believe wrong things. All of us do. But the question is, how do we come to those beliefs? How do we evaluate what we believe? And how do we evaluate what other people present to us? Now, he says here, by heaping scorn upon Smith's interpretation. Now, I don't take that as scorn. I think take, I take what James White says as a really valid argument, but... He says he's heaping scorn upon Smith's interpretation. White and it seems, Lear. Seems like, an odd thing, it seems like an odd thing for an academic to say. Because well, he, he's, not really an he's not an academic. Oh, I see. No, he's not an academic. No, he, he, academics would never write in this way. I shouldn't say that. Uh, um, Heidi Hike sometimes uh, enters into that ground in how he does things. But George, anyway, Knight is he, another, George Knight is another prime yeah, example of that. Yeah, so there are people who, who do that, but that's generally not the way to do things. Um, if you're writing more scholarly, right? By heaping scorn upon Smith's interpretation, White and Weir are in danger of fascinating the mind of their readers in unbelief, likened to the ridicule heaped upon Lot when he warned his sons, sons-in-laws, and daughters of the coming of the destruction of Sodom. Well, I think this would be a really hard comparison to make, right? It's not, one is they're not heaping scorn and they're not mocking. They're just saying, here are our reasons for believing that the papacy is the king of the north and that it makes much more sense to understand the role of the United States in prophecy 
rather than Turkey in prophecy at the end of the world. Uh, Theo goes on, after all, if God can bridge an impassable gulf between us through the righteous merits of his only begotten son, then what is a little matter of a few hundred miles here on this earth? We must recognize that prophecy is more than history that awaits fulfillment. Prophecy given by God is a promise of waiting for fulfillment. The 14th rule of Father Miller must be applied. We must have the attitude of Habakkuk. Now, we know the 14th rule is that we must have faith, right? Now, right. when you look at the 14th rule of Miller, it's really about obedience to God. That if we are to understand the truth, now, there's a, there's a fine line between faith and presumption, right? They, they, they appear to be the same, except that faith is founded upon the word of God and presumption is founded upon the assumptions and presuppositions of man, right? Say that last bit again. Well, well, faith is based upon the word of God. And presumption is based upon the assumptions, presuppositions of man, man's ideas. Right. So we can be we can just yeah. believe something and we say, I need to have faith in this. But if it's not based upon the word of God, if I can't use the biblical arguments to show that, then it's just presumption. Blind if, faith. If it look like faith. Right. You know, blind faith. God well, ask us to be well, blind in our faith. I mean, he gives yeah, us well, evidences yeah. of, you know, yeah. prophecies. I don't know if I would call it blind faith. I would just call it misdirected faith. Okay. Right. right. So, so we need to have a, a faith based upon God's word, not just upon like a group of people or man's authority or anything like that. So, so as individuals, each of us as an individual needs to have a faith that's grounded upon God's word, our relationship with God, our obedience to God. Right. That's what Miller is talking about in his 14th rule. And then he's going to talk about, you know, at the end of those rules about, um, you know, a person who just listens to other men. Right. Listens to authority. How does he put it? Let's find it here quick. Yeah, so the the fourteenth rule, right, says um, the most most important rule of all is we must have faith, faith that requires a sacrifice, and if tried, would give up the dearest objects on earth. Right? So this is an act of living faith um, based upon His Word, right? But these are the most important rules, which I find uh, the Word of God warrants me to adopt and follow in order for system and regularity. And if I am greatly deceived in so doing, I have found the Bible as a whole, one of the most simple, plain and intelligible books ever written, containing proof of, in itself of its divine origin and full of all knowledge that our hearts could wish to know or enjoy. Right, so he talks about the value of this. And then he talks it. Uh, and then he says, but this is but a faint view of its value. How many perishing souls treat it with neglect? or what is equally as bad, treated as a hidden mystery, which cannot be known. Then he says, the divinity taught in our, our schools is always founded on some sectarian creed and may do to take a blank mind and impress it with this kind, but it will always end in bigotry. A free mind will never be satisfied with the views of others. Were I a teacher of youth in divinity, I would first learn their capacity of mind. If these were good, I would make them study the Bible for themselves and send them out free to do the world good. But if they had no mind, I would stamp them with another's mind and write a bigot on their forehead and send them out as slaves. And, you know, the most important thing that we can do as we study, as we look at these types of issues, as we grapple with papers that people write, as we, we, we study together, the most important thing is, is our personal faith our personal walk with God, our understanding of God's word for ourselves, and, and that we're not manipulated by rhetoric or peer pressure, group pressure, pressured to conform. You know, um, you know, I was talking with my nephew uh, the other day, two days ago, and um you know, he's well, he's my brother David's son, and he's uh, he's a double cousin to to my my kids because uh, two brothers married two sisters and um 
You're welcome. Yeah, Kelly's responsible for that, introducing us. So uh, anyway, you know, he's so much like his dad and he's so much like my kids. You know, his dad was killed by a drunk driver October 13th, 1990. So Daniel's had a pretty rough life. You know, his mom kind of abandoned him. He was raised by different people, relatives and stuff, and um, lived with us for a year. Um, and he was pretty angry when I met him, uh, when, when I ran into him on Sunday. And I'm not sure what he was angry about, but he was angry at Seventh-day Adventists. And so he was giving me a really hard time. His wife was kind of upset with how he was talking to me. But I talked to him about, you know, the effect that his his dad had had upon me. That I mean, my brother Dave was the reason I became a Christian. He was the biggest influence in my life spiritually when I was a teenager. And, um, you know, that softened him quite a bit. But uh, the thing that that he doesn't understand about me, maybe you guys don't all know this about me, but I'm not really interested in the organization of a church or denominations. Now, I believe in Seventh-day Adventism, right? I believe in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And I believe that, that God raised up this church for a purpose, just as he raised up ancient Israel. But that purpose is not going to be realized by a dependence upon the church, right? The church is not the place where we find salvation, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's it's church has become a bureaucracy rather than a movement. Or a business. Hard, hard, yeah, yeah, big yeah. business. Right. So so when I became an Adventist, I mean, was not interested in joining a church, but I recognized that God was leading me in this direction to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And I was never a part of the, the culture and uh, a belief in, in the that the organizational structure was the way of salvation. I believe in that the individual needs to know God personally. So that that's my belief. So some Adventists don't like that. They think that I'm sort of not really an Adventist because I don't believe in the organization. Now I believe in organization and I believe that God had organization for a reason and that that organization has, that the church has entered into a new organization in 1919 with the books of the new order. I don't think it's a sin, you know, to be a part of the church and to work in the church, but we need to recognize that we can't just like, be saved in the church. We have to know Christ. And um, so when we deal with, with all of these, these issues, all of this confusion that's out there, the only thing that's going to save us is do we study God's word for ourselves? Do we have a living, active faith with God? It's not going to be what group do you support or what doctrines do you particularly support? Because sometimes we can believe things that are not correct, but we can still be following God because God's leading us to the truth, right? So sometimes people think if they join in a certain group where they take sides on some issue, that that somehow makes them saved, right? That that's the safe way. But we can see that it's not going to be some uh, creed, right? That's, you know, a sectarian creed that's going to save us, even if it's a Seventh-day Adventist creed. Amen. One one phrase that sticks in my mind at the church business meeting for my disfellowship was I said, even if you vote to disfellowship me, I'm going to keep coming to church. And one lady stood up and strenuously objected, but pastor, what if he keeps coming and talking about all of these things? And uh, he, he, he said, well, basically... We've unshackled Kelly. He's free to do what he, he wants. And I thought, that is a strange turn of phrase. Unshackled. <laughs> yeah, that means you were a slave before, right? Yeah, exactly. Under the control. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now, so, you know, people may think of me as the type of rebel, rebel, but, you know, I've never liked being controlled. So, you know, so people can just think, well, I'm just naturally rebellious and that's why I'm you know, the way I am. But mm -hmm. but I think it's the reason why I didn't like being controlled 
is because I want to have self-control. Right. I always, <laughs> you're not the boss of me. <laughs> so I got a little bit of a rebellious part in that sense, but learning to submit where it's yeah. right to submit is my challenge. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, I think all of us rebel against, um, I'm just sort of control or authority. At least I think we should. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we all have a sen- sense of injustice when it happens, whether to others or ourselves. Yeah. But we also can learn to submit to things that we have no control over. And that's the Christian part of it, right? The character part of it. So, so it's one thing to be rebellious um, against unjust authority, but also to recognize that God foresees over, oversees all, foresees all, and that that if we submit our lives to Him, no man can truly have authority over us. Right. That's right. Yeah. The yeah. voice of God, that still small voice. So, so anyway, this 14th rule to me is, is the most important, but the way that, that Thiel is using this rule is sort of like, well, you got to have faith. So that means even though we have this, this, this prediction that doesn't seem likely, we just have to still believe in it. But the thing is, I need reasons to believe it. I can't be bullied into believing it. I can't be manipulated into believing it. It needs Isaiah to be one eighteen. The word of God. What's that? Isaiah one eighteen. Come now, let us reason together. Yeah. And and that's the way that I would present truth. I would present truth. One is I need to be open when I'm presenting truth, right? Because if I'm if I'm sharing with someone, I need to be open to receive from that person as well. So with my nephew, I explained some of these things about my experience, right? And and he was impressed by that, right? And so, you know, they, they do want to uh, study with me, um, him and his wife. And, and so, which, which I kind of find remarkable in some ways. But, but I, I, you know, I somehow reached him whatever God gave me to say, because I believe it was a divine appointment that I ran into him. Um, you know, not just for him, but also for me. Um, but this is where we need to recognize this work that God has given us, that it is this personal one-on-one work. It is listening to God's voice. It is reaching the heart as well as the intellect uh, when we when we deal with people, that we're not trying to win some argument. We're not trying to beat people down. Now, we also always, need what's that? One thing, that, one thing that helps in that is always be ready to concede a point. If they have something that is valid, just concede it instead of arguing yeah. to protect you know, our whole, whole position. Right. Our whole position doesn't now, fall on one point. Mm-hmm. Now, we know that in, in our uh, Friday night studies, we've been looking at uh, what happened with the evangelical conferences. And so there's there's another side to that. So there can be a way in which we think where we're communicating with people, but we actually are giving up ground, right? So the one thing we don't do in in trying to um, interact with others who differ, disagree with us is we don't we don't yield ground uh, as like we're not just trying to connect with people. We're not trying to just get people to accept us. We're actually trying to connect people with Christ, right? So you can see the problem with the evangelical conferences is they have something that appears like, well, I'm going to be open and I'm going to interact with these evangelicals and and try to win them over. But but they're not they're not leading them to God. They're not just entrusting. They're not presenting the truth and just trusting that God can work on that person's heart upon those, those evangelicals hearts. Instead, they're yielding ground to get accepted individually, right? To be for the church to be accepted, right? Do you understand the difference? How these things can, this can be a counterfeit of what I just said, what the event, what the, 
the church did in the 1950s. You, you understand the difference. If, if I trust that God can work upon a person's heart, I can present the truth to them. I don't have to modify it so that person will accept it, right? I want that person, I want that person to change to accept the truth. I'm not going to change what I believe so that the person accepts it. Called sugarcoating the truth. So it's palatable. Yeah. And, but and trusting I, God that the hard things, to, you know, don't bring up the hard things first. Establish rapport with a person so that yeah. they feel think connected about, with right. it. If you think about the opportunity that our leadership had with this minis- meetings with the evangelicals, they had an opportunity to present Adventism to them and to make a case for the investigative judgment and to make a case for the nature of Christ. Correct golden opportunity yeah they had this opportunity to present how adventists see the gospel but instead they did more than just squander it they sold their birthright for a mess of pottage correct that would be agreed yeah so this is something we we have to we have to understand you know that there is there's things that can appear close to the truth and 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 yet aren't so so in 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 i'm just trying to give a real balanced view of this that that, that there is this this personal work that we have to do but we do have interaction with others we have an interaction with the church we have a responsibility to each other and we don't know everything but there are things that that we do know we do know that god's word is true and that any argument being presented has to be supported by God's word. <clears throat> okay, he says, uh, let us for a moment, before moving on to Weir's next, next objection, uh, consider what Ellen White wrote about prophecy, predictions, promises, and how the character of God revealed in his people will bring him glory. In a nutshell, this is what, um, page, this is what uh, delayed this is what delayed uh, fulfillment of this prophecy is all about. The circumstances are the apostasies of God's people, God's expression for justice, Moses' intercession for mercy, and God's promise of pardon, not only in Moses' day, but also in ours. It was upon his knowledge of the long suffering of Jehovah and his infinite love and mercy that Moses based his wonderful plea for the life of Israel when, on the borders of the promised land, They refused to advance in obedience to the command of God. At the height of their rebellion, the Lord had declared, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And he had proposed to make the descendants of Moses a greater nation and mightier than they. Numbers 14, 12. But the prophet pleaded the marvelous providences and promises of God in behalf of the chosen nation. And then, as the strongest of all pleas, he urged the love of God for fallen man. Graciously, the Lord responded. I have pardoned according to thy word. And then he imparted to Moses in the form of a prophecy, a knowledge of his purpose concerning the final triumph of Israel. As truly as I live, he declared, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God's glory, his character, his merciful kindness and tender love, that which Moses had pleaded in behalf of Israel, were to be revealed to all mankind. And this promise of Jehovah was made doubly sure. It was confirmed by an oath. As surely as God lives and reigns, his glory should be declared among the heathen, his wonders among the people. So Theo goes on, God's glory will be fulfilled in us. The sealing should have been finished by now, but in and by his mercy, the commandment is proclaimed to hold back the winds of strife until the sealing is complete. Now, of course, we would agree with this, that there has been this delay and that um, we need to focus upon the work that God has given us the promises that he has given us that he's going to complete it it doesn't really support his argument that turkey's going to move the capital uh their capital from um constantinople or istanbul to um to jerusalem right uh the prophecy of daniel eleven forty three. so this is the second point of uh weirs the prophecy of daniel eleven forty three says the king of the north Says the king of the north, the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be at his steps. In Exodus 11, verse 8, margin. 
The same expression is employed when referring to the Israelites acting under, under the government of Moses. So in, it's going to refer to the same expression is employed. So we'll take a look at that Exodus 11 verse 8. Here, I'm just going to look at that. And all these servants shall come down unto me and shall bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. So I'm not sure what he's referring to. That's Exodus 11, verse 8. Well, that maybe it's just, I will follow. Um, that's probably what he's referring to. Okay, that's Hebrew number 72, 72. Okay, anyway, I'll read this here. <clears throat> Sorry about that. See, so see Judges 4.10, 1 Kings 20.10, the margin, 2 Kings 3.9. The Ethiopians were never under the government of Turkey. They were never in the steppes of Turkey. Gibbon says that after the 7th century, compassed by the enemies of their religion, the Ethiopians slept for nearly a thousand years, forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten. So this is, we're saying basically, if we're going to be taking these nations literally, then we would have to take Libya and Ethiopia, literally. And he's saying that the Ethiopians were never under the government of Turkey. So this is an argument of Weir. Now, um, yeah, I'm just looking at this word here. So, okay, so that's what he's referring to in that verse. Is, uh, is following, okay. Okay, um, Context is everything. We quoted Gibbon so far as it's, as it, he, he, we're quoted Gibbon so far as it benefits his objection. However, he purposefully omitted the very next sentence, paragraph even, obscuring the time frame of Gibbon's statement, as we shall soon see. The events recorded by Gibbon do not include the papal bull that granted the Portuguese the right to attack Muslims who upon observing the friendship developing between Port Portugal and Ethiopia would want to prevent such a ludicrous, lucrative trading alliance. Okay. Um, okay. So they were awakened by the Portuguese who turning the Southern promontory of Africa appeared in India. So this is 1525 to 1550. Uh, appeared in India and the Red Sea as if they had descended through the air from a distant planet. In the first moments of their interview, the subjects of Roman Alexandria observed the resemblance rather than the difference of their faith, and each nation expected the most important benefits from an alliance with their Christian brethren. In their lonely situation, the Ethiopians had almost relapsed into the savage life. Their vessels, which had traded to Ceylon, scarcely presumed to navigate the rivers of Africa, and the ruins of Axum were deserted. The nation was scattered in villages, the emperor, a pompous name, but was content both in peace, uh, peace and war and with the immovable resistance of a camp. But the public danger suit called for the instant and effectual aid of arms and soldiers to defend an unwarlike people from the barbarians who ravaged the island country and the Turks and Arabs who advanced from the sea coast in a more formidable array. Ethiopia was saved by 450 Portuguese who displayed in the field the native valor of Europeans and the artificial powers of the musket and cannon. In a moment of terror, the emperor had promised to reconcile himself and his subjects to the Catholic faith. The Latin patriarch represented the supremacy of the pope. The empire, enlarged in a tenfold proportion, was supposed to contain more gold than the mines of America and the wildest hopes of avarice and zeal were built on the willing submission of the Christians of Africa. Okay, I'm not really sure I follow what his argument is here. Anybody understand what the what the objection is to what Weir has said? Forgive me for my wandering mind, but what is it again? Well, the idea is that we are saying that, you know, if we're taking, basically he's saying, if we're taking Turkey as literal, then we have to take the Libyans and the Ethiopians as literal. And he's saying the Ethiopians were never under the government of Turkey. They were never at the steps of Turkey. And Gibbon says that after the seventh century, compassed by the enemies of their religion, the Ethiopians slept for nearly a thousand years, forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten. And then he's going to use this paragraph saying, well, 
the Portuguese came in and saved uh, Ethiopia at at some point. From uh, I'm not I'm not versed in the history of all that. So. Me neither. But I'm not really sure how this, if they were saved from the Turks and Arabs who were coming against them, how is this how is this even addressing what the prophecy is talking about? I, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure I understand this argument. Um, it should be here noted that Gibbon wrote extensively on the history of Rome and not of Ethiopia. We cannot be certain of the borders of Ethiopia in the time of Daniel or how precisely they fluctuated during the nearly thousand years Ethiopia was safe from Roman Catholic persecution. So Weir could not possibly rely upon Gibbon for a history of interaction between Ethiopia and the Ottoman Empire, except in this one instance nearly 250 years before Daniel 1143 was fulfilled by the overwhelming Ottoman response to the invasion of the French in 1798. We have this observation made by a commentator who lived through the Neapolitanic Wars, uh, the Libyans and Ethiopians, the Kushan, unconquered Arabs, all sought their friendship, and many of them are tributary to the present time. One does not have to be conquered to be a follower, as Weir attempts to establish by his Bible word study. Tributes may be levied to protect um, sovereignty and independence, much the same way Byzantium. Uh, prevented the invasions during the nearly 3,000 years it outlasted the fall of the West. Ignoring Adam Clark, Weir casually, casually dismisses history that does not fit into his desired objective to vindicate James White as a mean for establish, means as a, for establishing his own views. Now, I actually don't believe that, that Weir uses James White as a means for... So one is the whole characterization of how Weir uses James White I'm not really a fan of because that's not why what we are is trying to do. He's not trying to vindicate James White. And he's not using James White as a means for establishing his own views. So that characterization is incorrect. But but I'm not really sure what that argument that Weir makes. Yeah, Kelly. Uh, One thing I do recall about Ethiopia is that, that they were a group of Sabbath keepers there. They kept the Sabbath. Is that why the papacy, one of the reasons for them giving them trouble? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, just it's one sort of those things. So Some we have way. Ethiopia and Libya representing uh, the rich and the poor. Ethiopia is um, the rich and Libya the poor, I believe. But I'm, I've never been really convinced on that interpretation of Ethiopia and Libya. But because I, I don't really find strong support for it. But the one thing we'd have to say is that this is going to be talking about, if it's literal, then it has to be Ethiopia and Libra, Lib, uh, Libya literally, right? So exactly how that would be fulfilled or what they're trying to say regarding Turkey. I mean, Turkey would move its capital, Jerusalem, and Libya and Ethiopia would be following them, be at their steps. Yeah, so, so, yeah, Stephen. To me, it sounds as if he's saying that the, the Arabs and the Turks, or Islam anyway, almost at some stage conquered Ethiopia, but the Portuguese. Almost. Yeah. Yes. But the, uh, but the Portuguese uh, stepped in and prevented that. So he's just sort of saying this almost happened in the past. So Maybe it could happen in the future. Yeah, that's yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's an argument that I would, you know, either from Weir's perspective or from Theo's perspective, really address. I mean, it's it's kind of obscure, right? So, so I'm not even sure that I understand Weir's arguments completely on that point. Yes, it's not a very well, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not really a big, strong argument. No. No. But but it's one of the weaknesses in his arguments that, that Thiel is pointing out. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes. So uh, the prophecy also declares in Daniel 1140, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. So this is weird. 
In support of the belief that Turkey is the king of the north, it is said that in 1798, Egypt did push or make comparatively feeble resistance against France. When we permit the Bible to be its own expositor, we learn from the use Daniel has already made of the word push, 8 verse 4, that it is employed to describe a power that is vigorous and successful in its campaign. So uh, Thiel says, we accept that Daniel 8 4, we are mistakenly published Daniel 7 4 as the source of verse in his next sentence, uh, describes a pushing that is successful in its result. So there is a typo in originally, I guess. But if we accept the Bible as its own expositor, we don't rest upon one verse only to ascertain the word, meaning of a word as we appears here to do. The word has more to do with initiating aggression. Note how Moses passed down legislation regarding the ox that gores or pushes to the point of injury or death. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of an ox shall be, be quit. But if the ox were want to push with his horn in time past and hath been testified to his owner and hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and his owner shall also, also shall be put to death. Ezekiel gives another example of aggression in this parable warning us against the harsh attitude towards those who are weaker than us. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, behold, I even I will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the disease with your horns till ye scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them and shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. While many instances in the Bible give the impression that push, pushing results in victory, such is not always the case. When King Ahab sought to support from uh, King Jehoshaphat, we read about the false prophets who indicated success would result from initiating aggression. Instead, defeat followed and Ahab was slain. And Zedekiah, the son of Kenaniah, made him horns of iron. And he said, thus saith the Lord, with these shalt thou push the Syrians until they have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied. So saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. The simple fact of history is that Egypt initiated aggression against France that it could not sustain, just like Ahab initiated warfare against the Syrians that ended with his death. Napoleon's battle tactics on land proved superior, despite the naval debacle on the Nile, and much of Egypt came under the temporary occupation of France. Now, this one's an easy one. So has he supported his view with the use of these verses, especially the last one there in... Uh, Dealing with Zedekiah. I don't think so. No. So could we say what Egypt did, which is described as feeble resistance, as pushing based on those verses? We, we can't. And, I think and we established that yesterday. Of, what's that? I think, I think we established that yesterday with yeah. slight resistance does not equal push. Right. And and we can also see here this example that he gives while well, he says it doesn't always result in in success. Well, he is proclaiming that it's going to be success when the, these will push the Syrians until they have consumed them. Right. OK, so this this uh, verse here is um, what's the verse first uh, Kings 22, 11 and 12. So if we look at those verses. Yeah, that's a poor argument. It's a poor it's, argument? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're prophesying that they are going to have this here victorious victory. Yeah. And uh, just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it changes the context of the, what the meaning of the word is. Right. And, and this is going to be a false prophet, right? Yes. So... So the false prophet is not prophesying defeat. He's prophesying victory by using the word push. Yeah, so it's it's pretty clear. I was just looking at the verse. Where did I go here? Okay. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll stop there, I think. Uh, I don't think we have time to look at, at the rest of this here. But, um, you know, 
we're trying to be fair here with with uh, David Thiel. And, um, you know, obviously he believes differently than we do. We're obviously concerned about him. We're not trying to attack him as a person. We don't know him personally. We don't know his character. We don't know his motives. He has a belief that we don't share. And I haven't seen a good reason yet in anything that he's presented to to accept the idea that we should take all of Daniel literally and that we should take the, the nation of Israel literal as part of a prophecy at the time of the end. So, you know, he believes that that's a false hermeneutic and that it doesn't follow Miller's rules. But we know that it does follow Miller's rules because Miller understands that there's types, that not everything is to be taken literally. And that there are there are reasons why we take things as symbols, especially when we're told they're symbols or they don't make sense literally. So so the Battle of Armageddon, exactly how he understands it. Part of the problem I have having with Thiel is he doesn't really lay out his beliefs in in an orderly manner, right? So it's a lot easier if somebody says, here's what I believe, here's the verses, here's why. Um, instead, he's he's using this as a criticism against Weir. That's his sort of framework in which he's he's doing this. Now, I haven't found any other papers that he's written, but I'm sure there must be some. He must have written some other stuff. Maybe. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe this is the one presentation that he did. But at this point, I don't see good arguments. Now, he's going to go, you know, he's going to go through. Let me see. Here we got Four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's going to be, I think, eight weak, nine weak arguments, right? And and some of these are going to be addressing uh, a lot of other statements. So I think there's nine nine arguments that um, we're going to have to look at. So we've looked at three of them. So we've got six more. Oops, I skipped. I don't know where that was. And and so finding these weaknesses, I, I don't think is is the best way to present truth. But that that's my understanding of things. And I don't know. okay, there's one, two, three. I'm just trying to line this up. A- any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I mean, are we finding this this profitable? This this study, the way that we're approaching this. Number four. Uh... Uh, uh, the belief that in 1798 Turkey was the king of the north is that what we're saying? That, that, that's so, what Smith believed. Oh, so, I see. Well, yeah. so this is Weir saying the idea that Turkey is the king of the north and Egypt's the king of the south seems very incongruous. Mm, okay. So he's going to look at that argument. Now, there's lots of reasons why. I mean, one of the problems is, of course, that we talked about is. Since Egypt is a type of France, and that means France actually has the characteristic of Egypt, right? Sodom and Egypt in Revelation. And so if France is, uh, if Egypt's coming against France, how does that, how does that make sense, right? But we, we'll look at this, this one tomorrow. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had to study here this morning. We pray that you can be with each person. Um, We pray for those looking for truth. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, we can be faithful in our witness, that you can give us strength in the trials that we face each day. Be with us and bring us together again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.